Well, a good morning and a blessing to all of you. It's, it is a blessing to be here. Uh, this seems like it's, it's very tall here. Maybe I can, there we go. But I don't want to talk too loud into it either, so. Yes, uh, I appreciated what uh, Brother Johnny had to share this morning. And uh, I, uh, I knew, let me think, it was uh, Uncle, what, what, who did you mention first, who's 96 years old? David. Yeah, Uncle David. I knew him as Uncle David, and I would have known him. He, his, he was my first wife's uh, uncle. He was married to my first wife's uh, aunt. And uh, many, many times uh, we would visit them. Uh, we would visit Pennsylvania, and we'd get to, to see him. And just, I don't know when the last time was, just a number of years ago, uh, but he was always an inspiration. He was always the kind of person that, that you could talk to, and you knew where his heart was. He, he had a heart for God. And, and that Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place, the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty would have been a, a very good, this is where Uncle David was dwelling. And you could, like, like I said, you could never talk to him without having him talk about spiritual things. But he was also very practical. Uh, when, when we mo mostly saw each other was at family gatherings. And uh, he would do something for the children about every time. He'd have a little, little tractor and he'd pull these little... Uh, uh, barrels that had holes cut into them with wheels on them and and the children would look forward to Uncle David's train that they could they could uh, drive in so yeah it's it would be my desire to be that kind of a person that people would know where my heart is without hesitation without wondering I'd like to speak this morning about maybe the greatest need of mankind uh, what would you say is the greatest need in the world today? Anyone? Jesus? Need for a savior? Fear of God? Peace with God? Faith? Interesting your comments, interesting your response. Uh, basically, there's, there's two things. I believe that it's the two things that we have lost, that mankind lost when, when Adam and Eve sinned. They lost the meaningful relationship with God. They lost the fear of the Lord. And what Brother Dan said is actually uh, something that I heard many years ago I was in an, a, a, an audience when somebody was asked a question, uh, or the question was asked, what is the greatest need today? And an old man, Aaron Lapp from, uh, I think it's Aaron Lapp from Pennsylvania, was in the congregation. He said with his loud kind of heavy voice, the fear of God. And I'll just never forget that. That is what is the greatest need in the world today. Now, why would we think that the greatest need is the fear is fearing, is worrying, is, is fearing and worrying? I think we need to understand what the fear of God actually is. The book of Acts documents the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ. So you have at the end of Peter's sermon in chapter 2, verse 43, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So when God's program starts getting put into place, then it causes people to start trembling, not necessarily with a phobia kind of a fear, but with a, with a respect and honor kind of a fear. The movement kept growing in Acts. Chapter 3 and 4 and 5, and six, the church of Jesus Christ, if you read those chapters, you see how it is growing. In chapter seven, we find Stephen's sermon, which resulted in 
his being stoned. At the end of chapter 7, you find Peter, or G, uh, Stephen there, they were so angry at him that they took up stones and went and killed him with stones. And there was a man standing there who watched all the proceeding. He may have thrown stones as well. I don't know. But they put, his, put their garments at his feet. That man's name was Paul and Saul at the time. And, and he was blessing this, this action of killing this man, Stephen. In the next chapter, in verse chapter 8, persecution scatters the church into Judea and Samaria. And Paul was one of the components of this scattering. He, was, he got more angry and more angry, and he went out and did all he could to destroy this new movement, this church. Did Paul succeed? He did not succeed. In chapter 9, we find Paul being converted. And I'd like to take you to after chapter 9 Acts, uh, of Acts, verse 31. After, let's just go to that spot there, Acts 9, 31. He says here, Then the churches throughout Judea, all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. When the church, here they were all, everything was being upset. There was a lot of persecution. God, in his wisdom, got a hold of Paul, and Paul was converted. And Paul changed his attitude, and, his, and they couldn't believe it. They could not believe what actually happened. But it said after that, there was a certain amount of, of peace that happened. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So there you see a period of peace, a period of, of growth, a period of, but it was coupled with the fear of the Lord. There's something else, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So what they had lost, what Adam and Eve had lost in the beginning was the fear of the Lord, and they, for, they lost the relationship with the Lord. But if you go through Acts, you'll notice how many times it talks about the Holy Spirit this poured out upon them. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's the one who, is our, who we can relate to. He's the one that we, that we know as, as that still small voice in our hearts that, that, that gives that uh, dwelling in the secret place that we ta was talked about this morning. One more verse on fear in the New Testament is 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. God has not given us the spirit of of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, that word fear there happens to be not the same word as the, sa as the word fear of the Lord. That word fear means, it's the only time it's used in the New Testament as far as I could find. That word fear me is more of a, a spirit of timidity. It's a spirit, uh, it's, it's, a, it's just a, a spirit of, uh, the spirit of fear is, it's not bold, it's the opposite of boldness. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, timidity, of being timid, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I would like to go to Philippians chapter 7, if I can find it here. Sorry, Philippians doesn't have chapter 7 chapter. Philippians chapter 3. 
and read for you, because I think I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, when I talked about man's greatest need, and I'd like to, again, I'd like to cement in our minds what man's greatest need is. Paul, here, in Philippians chapter 3, says that what his greatest need is. He says, in, I'll start in verse 4. He says, I might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee. This is the same Paul that was persecuting the church. It says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I count of loss for the excellency of for Christ. Yea, yea, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. To, to gain Christ is the greatest need of all mankind, to know Jesus Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is through, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, Paul says, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, which he had a lot of things that were behind him, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this same mindset. And if anything, in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Paul here was, had the goal. He had a goal that was, that carried him through his whole life. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When you think of the spirit of fear, I remember as a little boy, being gripped with terror. There was a short walk from our house to the barn, and there was even a light that lit the way. But for some reason, there was a certain fear that I had. I don't know even what I was afraid of. It was some, I, I was afraid of walking from the house to the barn. Does anybody know of any, th any fears that have ever gripped you that you don't know why they were there, but it was something you didn't choose, but you actually, you know what it's like to be fearful about something. Anybody with me? Most of us at least have a little something that we, I, I also remember years ago I was exploring a cave and, and I got into, in between two rocks that were really narrow and I was like going sideways there, and all at once it got so tight that I could barely breathe. And, and I just thought it was like a, it was terrifying to be in that. That is not the kind of fear that we are to have. That God, that God gives us. God has not given us the spirit of timidity or that spirit of, of terror, but there's a different fear, and I'd like to talk about that more as we go through here today. One of the things I'd like to say is uh, there's a saying, and I think I've said it over the pulpit before, Troubles that never come make us the most gray hair. 
and backs are bowed by burdens that they never bear. Just remember that. The, the things that we worry about the most are really many times so minimal that they don't have to worry. So let's realize that. Now, the fear of the Lord is connected to wisdom numerous times through the Bible. In Job 28, 20, he, he writes it like this. And I'm going to read from the New English Translation. Job 28, 20 through 28, through verse 28. But do people know where to find wisdom? Where can they find understanding? For it, wisdom is hidden from the eyes of all humanity. Even the sharp-eyed birds in the sky cannot discover wisdom. But destruction and death say, we have heard a rumor of where wisdom can be found. God surely knows where it can be found, for he looks throughout the whole earth under all the heavens. He made the winds blow and determined how much rain should fall. He made the laws of the rain and prepared a path for the lightning. Then when he had done all this, he saw wisdom and measured it. He established it and examined it thoroughly. And this is what he says to all humanity. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. Now, some more results about the fear of the Lord. If you find the fear of the Lord, if you do a search, and I, didn't, I did not do nearly all, I did not bring up all the, the scriptures. I'm not going to read them all. But Psalm 19.19 19 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Psalm 34.11 says, Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Psalm 111.10 and Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.29 For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Now, when I was a little boy, the fear that gripped me when I wanted to walk from the house to the barn was not something I chose. I don't think any of you would choose that kind of fear. Am I right? We don't choose that kind of fear. But the fear of the Lord is a choice that we can make. And it's a choice that will result in good things happening, not in terror, not in, not in, in being paralyzed with fear. The fear of the Lord gives us wisdom. The fear of the Lord is, is clean. It endures forever. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 14.26, in the fear of the Lord, and get this one, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. That's the opposite of what people, what we think. When we think of fear, we think of a lack of confidence. We're not, we're fearful. We're not going to go there at all. But in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. That gives us confidence to move ahead. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 15, 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord, then great treasure and trouble therewith. What would you rather have? A little, it said better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. There's people who have great treasures and a lot of trouble. And there's other people who have little but they have the fear of the Lord. And it's satisfying. 
Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 16, 6. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. How many of you would like to see men departing from evil in our world today? It's because there's no fear of the Lord that men are just reveling in evil. But by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. When we have humility, we, we recognize that, that it's not, not my own power, not my own strength, but it's in what God does, then we have riches and honor in life. Isaiah 33, verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The person who has, it, it's simply from God. That's, that's what we need. And then in the New Testament, as I said before, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. Now, I had a title for this sermon. Uh, what I, I will tell you the history of this sermon. I preached it for Mother's Day uh, about four weeks ago in America. Whenever, whenever the Mother's Day was in America, I can't remember. You had a Mothering Day here earlier than that. I had Mother's Day sermon in America. And I titled the sermon facing your fears and winning. Now, I don't know if that's a good title or not, because sometimes when you face your fears, you, when you don't face your fears, you lose all the time. But when you actually face your fears, you can win. The title that I have put today was maybe man's greatest need. I still don't know for sure what to title the sermon today. But we could use facing your fears and winning. If we look at Job, Job said, what I feared has come upon me. The worries of Job is actually what came true. Do you remember that? What he feared came upon him. And what came upon Job was he lost all he had except for his wife and maybe a few sorry friends that didn't give him very much uh, help. Actually, what Job had left was the fear of the Lord. Because his wife said, curse God and die. And Job said, no, I'm not going to curse God and die. He respected, he feared the Lord too much for that. He trusted in God the whole, whole time. The only thing that Job, Job had left was his integrity. And he held on to his integrity throughout his whole life. And his belief that he was innocent, that his Redeemer lived, and that he would someday see God was what carried Job through. Because he, he believed that God had a purpose. Somehow, we know the whole story. Because we're told what happened in heaven before Job's temptations all happened. But Job didn't know that. What about you? When you're going through hard trials and temptations, you don't know what is going on in the throne room up ahead, up above. You don't know what permission Satan has asked of God to tempt and test and try you. You just know that you're going through a hard time. You just know that you're having trouble. Are we going to be in the camp of 
Job's wife? Or are we going to be in the camp of Job, who kept on trusting God? I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end, he shall, and it's, he shall stand at the, other, at the end, and after, he says, after my skin worms have destroyed this body, now there's different translations, but anyhow, after, after my body is destroyed in the grave, yet from out of my flesh will I see God. That's what Job said. He knew that his Redeemer lived. It's been a bit hard for us back home. We attended at least four funerals, if not more. And just this past week, a man that I, that I uh, respected greatly from our own church, about three or four weeks ago, he discovered he had pancreatic cancer. Monday morning. He passed away. And just a week and a half before that, another man who was only 80 years old on his 80th birthday, he passed away. Uh, now, you say, well, 80, that's pretty old. Yeah, it is pretty old. But he still, you know, he doesn't, 80 doesn't seem near as old as it used to, right, Dan? So, uh, and I keep thinking, well, how many years do I have till I'm 80? Well, that's not that many years. And, and Jonas Gingrich, who the young man, or the, the, yeah, the young man, the man who just passed away last week, he was 77. That gives me 10 more years. And honestly, I don't know how long we're going to be here, but are we going to keep our integrity? Are we going to believe in God? There was something about Jonas's life that he was, he was satisfied. It was like watching him go through this sickness. He had so much peace. He knew that he was just closer, uh, one day closer to where he wanted to be someday. And, and that was a blessing to watch that happen. Uh, we were not able to be there. Uh, if we would have been, we would have been, it would have felt good, but you can't always be wherever you want to be. When we recognize fear and worry, it is important to, to turn those fears into godly desires. Now, I was told that many years ago, whenever I have a fear, take that fear and switch it and start praying about that fear and turn it into something godly, something good, something you can pray about that, 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 is, that changes the situation. And I think rather than being paralyzed by fear, we need to be motivated to pray, to trust as we, whenever we get fear, fearful. Instead of what, uh, that, what often happens is our fears cause us to become idolaters. Here's a quote from a mother. Actually, she's a foster mother who recognizes that aiming to create the perfect environment for our children can become an idol that we worship. And Karen is the one who alerted me to this. Uh, and she did it before the Mother's Day sermon. And she said, maybe you could talk about uh, fears that mothers face sometimes. And I've found it being useful not just for mothers, but for everybody, that for, for all Christians, that it is a useful tool and help. And so that's where I got it. It's, it's from Foster the Family. Dot, it's a Foster the Family blog. I don't know if it's fosterthefamily.org or what it is, but it's, but she writes it like this. Idolatry is deceptive. Recently, there have been so many times that I wish I could just wrap up my babies from my three-month-old baby to my 14-year-old baby and protect them and rescue them and make everything okay for them. First glance, this looks like a mama bear loving her kids. But I know, for me, for now, it's deeper than that. I want to be in control. I want to be the one writing the story in the way I think the story should go. I resent the hardship and the hurt. 
and I doubt that God's lovingly using it to do something good. I am fearful and anxious and desperate and sad, oblivious to the goodness and sovereignty of my and their Heavenly Father. I want to be God. My mama's heart for my kids becomes idolatrous when I forget the God above it all, when I try to rip them from his hands into my own, when I doubt and decide he doesn't actually plan good, when I believe I could be a better God than he. Thank God I'm not in control. Thank God that he is. My kids are safer in his hands than they could ever be in mine and I willingly relinquished them into his loving and wise care. Now this mother is concerned about her children, but all of us have things that we're concerned about. All of us have things that we want to take control of. It might be something in our job, it might be something in our family, it might be something in our, it, it might be a lot of things that we want to have control of. Uh, but she says, Thank God I'm not in control. Thank God that he is. My kids are safer in his hands than they could ever be in mine, and I willingly relinquish them into his loving and wise care. Now, when we were discussing this quote with a family around the table last, uh, this is not last week, about we were in Holmes County and we were discussing this uh, around, the, uh, with, around the family, around the table, and... Uh, Actually, it so happens that Heather's mom and dad were there as well, because they're family. Uh, but one of the men said, so does that mean we just sit back and let whatever happens to happen without us doing anything about it? Is that what it means to relinquish, to let go? Absolutely not. I don't think that that relinquishing and letting go means that we don't talk about life, that we don't take our responsibility and set up parameters and set up uh, things that, that should happen. But we must let the outcome to God. We must recognize that, that there's more involved than just seeing the outcome that we see in our own minds happening because God has a bigger picture in mind sometimes than we do. What we're called to do is love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to be involved in building God's kingdom on earth. What we are not to do is to worry or fear about what happens to those who God has placed under our care. I often think of God himself and Adam and Eve. Was God the perfect father. Of course. What did he do when he saw Adam and Eve take that fruit that he had told them not to do? What did he do when he saw the, the destruction that was happening in the world? What did God do? Was it his fault? Many people want to fault God. Well, he should have made us so that we can't sin. Well, how many of you would like to be on a train track that you couldn't make any choice of any kind? What would your life be like? It would be completely different. It would be like being a rock, maybe. Oh. I've already asked the same question of many audiences, and nobody would want to change that part of their life. We all see the value of being made being able to choose. But remember what I said, the fear of the Lord is, is a choice that we can make. Happy are those who choose the fear of the Lord. This mom continues. She says, as we face the once fears and now realities, I see how much my former worries were limiting God. My fears are creative and consuming and well thought out but there is one thing they always lack, the grace that is guaranteed to join me if I ever face the fears. If I face my fears, then I have grace that comes alongside of me. I don't have grace for my imagination, 
I don't experience the merciful, sustainable hand of God within my worst case scenarios. I can't, take the, can't know the power that will surely be mine through Jesus as I anticipate the frightening. See, the biggest nation in the world is our imagination. And we often worry about so many things and God doesn't give us grace for our imaginations. But he does give us grace when we think about the worst thing that could happen. And we say, oh, I can take care of, I, God is with me in that worst case scenario. And yeah, I could just tell you example after example of, of when, when the worst thing actually does happen. I've had bad things happen in my life. And I realize when I face those bad things with the grace of God, then he makes a way. He helps us in and through those hard times. But when I'm having nightmares and dreams and worries, he's not, he doesn't really give me that grace. It's, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I found that facing my fear is far less frightening than feeling the fear. Those things that would have gripped my heart with fear now just push my, me towards the Savior. The trying has become the teaching. Worry makes way for worship. And I know, in other words, when worry leaves, worship comes. Got it? When, when we stop worrying, then we start worshiping. And I know and love him, God, the better for all of it. The thing about, a God's, about God's love is that it isn't divided among his children. It's multiplied by them. And actually, the quote was, the thing about a mother's love is not that it's divided with more children. It's, it's multiplied by more children. But I, I thought about it in a little bit, bi bit bigger sense. God's love, when, it, when there are more children, is just multiplied. And it's a little bit like troubles shared are divided and joys shared are multiplied. I'd like to go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 to finish because we really didn't quite get done in our Sunday school. And it just, I felt like it was a, a good, good reminder of where we are, where we can be. Hebrews chapter four, uh, 2, verse 14, Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of, the, of death, that is the devil. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, when we, are, when we have the fear of death, then we're subject to bondage all our lifetime. But Jesus came to release us who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of the Lord gives us freedom. The fear of the Lord is something that, that releases us from that worry and fear. For indeed, he does not give the aid to an angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Guess what? We're the seed of Abraham if we're faithful. Therefore, in all things, he had, made, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in, in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to also aid those who are tempted. God is big enough to deal with our fears. And, but we first we have to choose the fear of the Lord. I'm going to go back to that verse. Uh, Proverbs 129, it says, They hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And I would like to just put it in front of you this morning. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose to fear death, fear all kinds of other things? 
are you going to choose to fear the Lord? Because that is a choice you can make. And there are many, many blessings involved with, with choosing the fear of the Lord. In fact, the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is great treasure. The fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom. From the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Uh, the fear of the Lord is our treasure. Let's not forget that. And I'm speaking to myself as much as to any of you. So may I take that to heart too.